universe. SU universe. Sunny, welcome and hello to everybody who is joining us for our next session of the day. We've got uh, Sunny Coley here from SU Canada, another one of our great partners. I didn't realize this, but we have, we're just loaded up with uh, faculty from our partners around the world today, which is super, super exciting. So shout out to the uh, Canada team up to my north here in the United States. Um, Sunny's going to talk to us about uh, virtual healthcare and uh, maybe a little bit about what he's seeing in the hospital that he is at. So he is a practicing physician of intensive care in Canada uh, and also one of the founding faculty members in SU Canada. Um, his team was the recipient of the bold Epic Innovator Award in the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize competition um, for the uh, Vitality Tricorder. Their spinoff company, uh, CloudDX, is now a provider of remote patient monitoring technology across the globe and currently focusing their resources on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it looks like we may have lost Sonny's video for a second, but he should come back. Sonny, are you still there? I am indeed, yeah. All right, fantastic. That's all you now. Thanks for joining us. Indeed, yeah. Can you see me just fine? Uh, we can we can hear you. I think your your video just dropped, but um, the slides are okay. up, so you're good to go. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. So thanks everybody for having me. I'm here to talk to you about virtual healthcare in a time of pandemonium. Pardon the pun, but I had to. Um, An underutilized resource. So without further ado, we'll get right into this. So I think over the next half an hour, if we can transmit the following take-home points, it would be uh, I'd be a victory for me. So the first is that I just wanted everyone to understand. And that virtual healthcare is now just is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It should not just be viewed as healthcare. Um, and I'll define what virtual healthcare is in a moment. We should also learn how virtual care can be used in times like this during a pandemic. Recognize that we are underutilizing virtual care in this time of need. And then you know we'll we'll leave with uh, uh, learning about new technologies that may help us in future outbreaks. In keeping with sort of the singularity university philosophy of exponential technology. So. Let's define virtual care for those that aren't in this space. Um, it's a broad term. It encompasses all the ways that healthcare practitioners provide for care remotely. Uh, so it can sometimes be used to define video visits. If you've ever done that with your with your physician or your nurse practitioner or nurse, uh, secure text messaging, all sorts of different ways that we can remotely communicate with our patients. It's sometimes used interchangeably with telehealth, telemedicine, or digital health. Um, and it's certainly uh, becoming uh, quite the norm. And in fact, uh, in keeping with that concept, um, it's uh, it's certainly well accepted by patients and satisfaction rates go way up. Their user experience goes up. They feel more connected to their providers. And as a matter of fact, it's now being broadly accepted by most care practitioners. Previous myths about digital health or virtual care, such as it not, a virtual visit not being as effective as a face-to-face -face visit, they're being dispelled. So this, this nice graphic from Canada Health InfoWay, which is a nonprofit uh, federal institution based out of Canada that sort of espouses the, the virtues of virtual care, uh, sort of speaks to that. In-person visits are still essential in some cases, but for most scenarios, and we probably all agreed as consumers of healthcare, that virtual visits will probably suffice for many of the scenarios that we, we interface with the healthcare system. So as I mentioned, virtual care is now just care. So in, in the United States with CMS, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, both organizations have codes that allow practitioners and institutions to re get reimbursed for virtual care. It's now just ubiquitous. Um, and in Ontario, we now have uh, reimbursable visits for patients who are, for physicians who wanna provide uh, remote care, or virtual care. They can now be reimbursed for that. It's now no longer a fee, a fee service. Uh, a free service, it can, that the physician will be compensated for their time if they did this. So the, the, the dams are breaking down to allow this to, to, to uh, you know, exponentially increase in terms of its uptake. And as I mentioned, it's, it's now just care. So when you look at the ecosystem in the United States as of this year, there's payers on board, there's providers on board, there's manufacturers, there's distributors, there's an entire ecosystem. So for the, the consumer or for the provider who's interested in providing this level of care, there should be no barriers now. You have lots of choice, lots of lots of access, and you'll be more than um, adequately reimbursed for these for these services. So, how can virtual care help us with COVID nineteen? So, uh, you know, by example, here's a colleague of mine in Canada, a Dr. Rick Titus. 
Um, he's recently been isolated because of an exposure he had to a positive individual. And, and he's, a, he's a very active physician in our community. And here's him in LinkedIn. He's still providing care using a virtual care platform. He's seeing his patients. He's messaging his patients. He's doing video visits with his patients. He's still being compensated for his time. So he's going about business as usual and still you know, putting a dent in the pandemic from, the, from the, his little corner in his home without even leaving his home. That's the power of virtual care from the pan, from a pandemic perspective. So, you know, just briefly, it can be used to screen our patients who are worried or ill. You can remotely monitor those with suspected infection or proven infection. We can care for our other patients, perhaps who have nothing to do with COVID-19, but who still need ongoing care because of their chronic conditions. And of course, most importantly, we can minimize our exposure for our healthcare workers who are certainly a limited resource to COVID-19 by making sure that we, we provide our care virtually. And when you think about what's currently being done from a pandemic perspective to screen for patients to provide care, I would argue it's better. So here are some graphics that I pulled from, uh, from news feeds over the last 24 to 48 hours. There's an example of one of the pop-up drive-through screening um, clinics that are occurring all across North America. My community is no exception. It's happening in parking lots here. And, and there's just an example of, you know, digital uh, paper charts being used as opposed to digital surveys. You know, uh, healthcare workers doing their best to maintain isolation, but you can see with your own eyes, it's not ideal. There's obvious skin exposure, um, cars lined up, wait times. It's, 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 it's beholden to how the weather is holding up. You know, you can imagine the emotional stress and toll this is taking on not only those waiting for screening, but the healthcare workers who are providing this screening. So there's got to be a better way to do this. And I would argue that it's virtual. So when you look at how virtual technology can be leveraged to do this in a way that's safe for both, for both practitioner and for, for user, just imagine deploying a digital survey en masse to the entire community. So certainly CloudDX, my company is doing this, but we're not the only vendor doing this. There's lots of very good uh, providers and vendors in both Canada and the States taking on this challenge. Um, but because I know our company so well, I can speak to some of the tools that we're using. So we have a digital survey that you can download from our app through the Apple or Android store. And you can use this to screen yourself if you're being self-isolated or being quarantined, you can monitor your symptoms. It can also be used as an initial screening tool to identify those that should go on to have further screening with perhaps an azopharyngeal swab. Of course, of course, it can be used for assessment and triage, and you can plug and play Bluetooth devices to automatically collect needed vital signs like temperature. And again, we're not the only company doing this, so I certainly don't want this to sound like a sales pitch. Uh, we can auto automate the process and instantly alert caregivers with notifications that certain people have met thresholds that warrant further um, attention, further screening, um, perhaps even hospitalization. And all of that can be automated. Imagine the burden that this would take off the healthcare system if we were to do this remotely, leveraging existing digital technologies and cloud-based systems. Well, this is all in place. Of course, with an online clinician portal, such as one that we have at CloudDX, but again, other vendors are doing this, I can instantly manage hundreds of patients from the comfort of my own home or in my own clinic without seeing them face to face and instantly identify those that need further action, uh, an email, a video visit, you know, and a, a message or an alert that they should go to the hospital immediately, et cetera, et cetera. And so briefly, from a use case perspective, not only would be use it, uh, useful for, for, for virtual triage and, and, and tracking, I would argue that even employers could avail themselves of this technology to help manage their employee bases. It could be used to monitor our sickest. In fact, maybe even keep them at home. If all they required was additional oxygen, we could take them out of the high-risk environment, which is the hospital, and, and keep them in home with good technology like this. So certainly there's plenty of use cases that we could use um, uh, that would help us from a pandemic management perspective. And to be honest, this just makes more sense. Me sitting at home, with digital technology, patient or user sitting at home with digital technology, everyone's exposure risk is minimized. Everyone's you know, socially distance, distancing themselves as per guidelines from our provincial, state, and federal governments. It just makes more sense. And yet, it's just not being utilized. So uh, when, you know, getting off that soapbox for a moment, uh, let's talk about future techno technologies. So certainly there's a lot in the works. We're a, one of many companies working on such techno technologies, but I think the one that'll excite many of the listeners here today is our cough analysis techno technology. This is one of the reasons why we won the uh, 
the Bold Epic Innovator Award and the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. So CloudDX is working on a smartphone application that will allow us to screen people with coughs. And that cough can be broadly classified into several categories, uh, what we would classify as a normal cough or a healthy cough, and in other coughs based on disease state. We've certainly done no testing whatsoever for COVID-19. As you can imagine, getting t cases uh, to, to cough into a phone at this stage is, is hard to come by. But we certainly envision a day where we'll be able to use this technology for mass screening and perhaps even diagnosis of a, of, of a respiratory currently being tested and verified for people with active tuberculosis in Africa with our partners at XPRIZE. Here's another example of emerging technology that could be very useful in a pandemic. So I don't know if many of you know this, but there's an, a, a startup based in, in Canada called Blue Dot, and it basically scans the internet for information to help identify early outbreaks. And in fact, it got recent very uh, favorable press for being the first organization on the planet to identify the Wuhan outbreak. This was before the World Health Organization was even aware of it, just based on news and big data tracking. So their principal, Dr. Cameron Khan, he's actually an infectious disease specialist. Um, and he's been working on Blue Dot for several years now. And lo and behold, it was ready for this pandemic and identified it before anyone else. Uh, along the same lines of future or emerging technologies, the other reason why we were recipients of the Bold Epic Innovator Award is for our uh, coming wearable technology we're calling it one of the most advanced wearables in the world, um, and it's called Vitality. So just imagine wearing this, this wearable around your neck, and it's tracking all of those measurements from your blood pressure continuously on a beat-to-beat -beat basis to heart rate, ECG, your breathing rate, your positional information, your oxygen levels, your temperature, all in real time, streaming it to the cloud to instantly alert caregivers if you're deteriorating. Certainly this could be overkill for the average person with COVID-19 or a similar illness, but for those who are at high risk, I, I would argue this would be very useful technology to identify those deteriorating early and, and apply the necessary interventions. So what are the take home points from my, from my talk today? The first is that vir virtual care is now just care. And I'm sure many of you have intersected with the healthcare system with an app, with a video visit, or with email or text messaging and would, and would agree with me. I would also argue that virtual care can help us all during a pandemic in ways that I just identified. It's certainly better than a, better than a pop-up drive-through screening clinic that we're currently using across North America and in fact the world. We're underutilizing virtual care. So in a time of need, our administrators are acting slowly and in a way that uh, I would argue is not to the best of our society's needs. A pop-up clinic where we're having face-to-face -face exposures in a way that I just demonstrated versus virtual screening, I would argue is better for the population and would be better in keeping with our social distancing guidelines. And yet, um, despite the fact that we're putting a lot of heavy resources, people capital, um, you know, and all different types of capital into those types of clinics, I would argue it'd be cheaper to do this virtually. And of course, I've already demonstrated a few technologies that may be useful for earlier identification and better care of future outbreaks. So with that, I'm going to allow Adam and whoever else to ask me questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sonny. Turning my stuff back on. There we go. Sure. I'll leave your take-home points up there. But well, it's between us for us. It might be somewhere else for you guys. But um, that way, we can keep those up. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's been it's been interesting in thinking about how we the initial I mean, even for me, response is like, well, if I get sick, I got to go <clears throat> go into some. Um, oops, did you lose me? Yeah, you yeah you're back now. Um, I have to physically go go in somewhere. It hasn't even crossed my mind yet that maybe that there's a an app or even just a local healthcare provider that could do it digitally without me physically having to go in. I think the thing that came to mind was one of the implications is with the drive-through testing, it's like you have to get a swab or a sample or something done. How do we do that uh, virtually? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So uh, one of the current ways um, it's being done by some districts is a virtual screening tool is being applied. Once somebody's identified as being a suspect case that's worthy of further testing, then a public health official is notified so they can drop ship through Amazon or some other mechanism the necessary testing kit to their home, or a public health official can show up at their doorstep and do the necessary testing. 
And that way we can sort of keep those that are suspected infections or proven infection away from the general public. And at the same time, we can track them digitally. Yeah, I mean, I, as well, luckily I'm, I'm healthy so far, I think. Um, it would just be so nice to be able to hop onto one of those as opposed to think like, now I've got to go to a hospital or a doctor's office and who knows what else is in there. Um, like there's, a, it seems like there's a whole lot more risks to doing that than just being at my home and talking to somebody and they can be like, no, you're probably good. Just, you know, wait it out for a couple of days or yeah, you should come in. You sound like you might have COVID-19. Yeah, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. All right. Let's see what we've got from the audience. Um, have you seen any AI being implemented yet for remote diagnosis of COVID-19? Not at all, no. Not yet. Um, in fact, AI in, is in its early stages in, from, a, from a broader healthcare perspective in terms of diagnosing illnesses, and it's certainly not being implied in a meaningful way in COVID-19. Fair enough. And we've got a session later on today. Um, it's going to be talking about uh, where AI is attempting to be implemented, so definitely come back for, for that session. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, uh, Carlos asked, could it be possible to have a pattern database of diseases so that somebody could create an app to track the symptoms and then calculate the probability of having a given disease? Um, if that's Carlos that was asking, that's a very astute question. And in fact, in fact, I think several companies, including ours, were working on that. Um, and there's some entire health systems on the planet Earth that have adopted uh, technologies to help them with triage, clustering of symptoms, and identification of disease states completely virtually. And once it's identified, the patient's identified with having a certain condition or being at risk of a condition, then the appropriate resource is applied. So in, in, in England, with the National Health Service and NHS, they're using an app-based screening tool for triaging patients. And once the patient enters all their symptoms, it then sort of determines what the next step should be in their healthcare system, entirely virtually. Got it. Right, we'll go to the next one here. I think I, Michael, I got yours earlier. Uh, sorry, I didn't give you a shout out. And um, somebody would like to know, is Cloud DX available in Spanish? And oh, is it great. available outside of Canada? It is indeed. Uh, most of our business, in fact, in the United States, because uh, systems like Medicare and Medicaid are reimbursing for remote patient monitoring, most of our business is in the United States. And we're certainly translatable into Spanish. Got it. Are there other, um, you mentioned there were other apps like CloudDX. How many companies are trying to innovate in this area or do something similar? Growing ecosystem and we're just one of a handful. So I certainly encourage you to do your due diligence and, and choose a vendor that's right for you. Right on. Uh, keep scrolling through these. Maybe uh, you can expand on what we talked about earlier, but how do you see virtual care and at-home point-of-care solutions coming together, um, especially in these moments? Like, are there things that you think are going to come out of this that you're maybe more excited about than others? Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So I never really got into our XPRIZE solution. I mentioned that the cough analysis was one aspect of our solution. Another aspect was our wearable. But in paying homage to the tricorder, we had a third element to our, our tricorder called Vitality. We actually had an at-home lab where you could use tool, you could collect blood or urine or saliva in very user-friendly ways and get instant diagnosis with a home-based lab. We certainly did not commercialize that, that, that technology. We partnered with Stanford and a, a, number, a number of other companies to, to, to create that technology just to prove the point that this could be done at home. But I see the, a day where the industry is evolving to a point where there will be at-home point-of-care diagnostic testing available that will instantly converge with symptom-based information and, and applied in a way to give you a, a home-based diagnosis. And if we if we don't have any type of virtual care available to us in our areas wherever we're at around the world, um, what are what are some things that we should be thinking about while we are at home, um, or you know, to determine whether or not we actually go and get care? Oh, nice, good question. So, from this is purely from a COVID nineteen perspective, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah otherwise, it'd be a pretty loaded question. I need another <laughs> few hours. <laughs> um, so, for COVID nineteen, there's a lot of readily available symptom-based surveys that you can scan for, you know, your local public health department or local state or federal government uh, will probably have a list of questions that's available to you online and you can go through that list. But broadly, it's simple as this. If, if you have symptoms consistent with COVID-19, so a fever, a cough, difficulty breathing, that definition is actually being expanded now to include other 
uh, symptoms like muscle aches, even diarrhea. Um, if you have concerning symptoms, um, you certainly should heighten your level of concern, isolate yourself socially. If you're not feeling that unwell and you think you can manage this at home, and if you think you need another level of testing because you've been exposed to a case of COVID-19, you've recently returned from travel. Uh, in Canada, we broaden our travel recommendations to anywhere outside of Canada, but there are high impact countries you should be more worried about. And certainly I encourage you to talk to your local health providers about whether or not you should be tested. The key, the reason why I'm not suggesting everybody go and get testing on mass is because there's a paucity of testing kits available right now. It's a scarce resource. So we don't want to overwhelm our, our healthcare systems with testing requests for those that are low risk of developing significant. Oh, we may have just lost the. You, Does that make sense? You said uh, that you don't recommend, and then we lost you for one second. Sorry, ma'am. I will repeat that. Um, I certainly don't recommend mass screening with the swabs for the for the lay public, especially for those with low risk illness, because there's a scarcity of testing kits available right now. So we don't want to exhaust our healthcare system with testing on people that don't necessarily need the testing. Right, for sure. What I think one of the one of the other challenges, and maybe you want to speak to this a little bit, is. Um, because it looks like COVID-19 can be infectious before you even start to show symptoms. So in, th in that case, um, I mean, it's, we just, I think that that's why social distancing ends up becoming such the, the, the right thing to do. What are, your, what are your perspectives on that? Well, great question. So I'm certainly in favor of social distancing. In fact, my daughter and I are sitting at home, um, cobbled up in our home right now, you know, with the same principle in mind. Uh, but there are there is some open discourse about whether or not there's even evidence that social distancing for those at low risk is impacting the disease course. So um, it's certainly a, a policy that's being adopted en masse by our government. But there is some open discourse in the scientific literature that we don't have any actual evidence that social distancing, especially from a COVID-19 perspective, can flatten the curve. So just, just for everyone to be well aware of that. And in fact, I would point you to an article that was written by my colleague in infectious disease, a Dr. Neil Rao. RAU, who wrote an, an op-ed in our Globe and Mail in Canada. It's readily available online where he speaks to that concept. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the most challenging things for me just as a normal human going about my day-to-day -day life is it's like one day you get you see this headline and everybody's all on, you know, this is definitely going to work. And then the next day it's like, and eh, maybe it's not going to work so much. It's just, it's amazing how fast this information is coming at us. How do we, Indeed. how do we sort through it? Oh, no. that's, a, that's a loaded question again, Adam. Um, finding, good, <laughs> finding good sources of information is critical. Uh, so if you, once, you, once you've found a reliable source of information, hang on to it and keep referring back to it for updates because you get familiar with how they deliver that information. You get familiar with that base set of information and you sort of you can contrast the changes and how it adapts to your life. So that's one way you could do it. Um, uh, that's probably where I will stop the, uh, answering the question there. <laughs> Fair enough. If, if I ever ask you something that you're like, eh, not my thing to answer, you have every right to say, <laughs> not my place. We appreciate that. <clears throat> um, all right, jumping back into the questions. Uh, Gabriella is, is curious, how can we apply this technology to third world countries where people don't have access to basic services or mo mobile phones and internet in their communities? Is, is that just kind of the, the, what you have to have in order to get started or is there is there an in-between? Well, I'm glad you asked. So in our experience, in fact, Gabriella, more and more we're seeing ubiquity of mobile phone services in, in places like Mozambique and other uh, you know very remote, low-income nations where we operate. Um, so I would argue that uh, most people in places like that do have access to that technology, either first person or with someone in their community. So you know, if there's if there's a will, there's a way to set up the systems that to help people in in, in our you know our remote remote communities or our lowest income nations. Yeah. All right. Try to pick out another one. Um. Drive through testing. I'm trying to find one that we haven't talked about yet. All right, well, let's go back to, um, before we hopped on, you were talking to me about uh, what was going on in, in Toronto. Can you tell us a little about what it's like right now in the, the hospital that you work in? Yeah, certainly. So um, uh, just for those of you that don't know, um, Canada is sort of evolving in, in our caseload on a day-to-day -day basis. We're all sort of operating with similar sort of unknowns. Everything's very fluid. 
as of yesterday, the government had said, you know, it's business as usual for our businesses. You can still go about your day, but isolate if you have symptoms or if you had a high risk travel history, like I mentioned. But then as of this morning, we woke up and everything is shut down except for our grocery stores and our pharmacies. So it, things are just so fluid right now. And so if you don't know, if you're in a jurisdiction you don't know and there's evolving caseload in your jurisdiction, I encourage you to stay, stay at home, socially isolate yourself until you get further direction. Yeah. One, one thing that um, I, I have read, and this is, I think, more of a question of like how accurate is it, is you hear about uh, the healthcare workers themselves really getting overrun, overworked, they get sick, um, and just hear about some potentially terrible situations that are out there. Um, how, how do you take care of yourself as a physician? I'm so glad you asked. So, you know, I know the resounding rhetoric is that 99.9% of healthy people are at low risk of serious infection, but it's not 100%. So I know of colleagues um, during the SARS outbreak. In fact, I was quarantined during the SARS outbreak as a resident in Toronto because I had exposure. And there was colleagues of mine that, in fact, developed the illness and, in fact, died of the illness. And they were otherwise low-risk, healthy individuals. So I think this similar type of uh, thinking should apply for COVID-19. There is, in fact, a, an emergency room physician in, in Washington State who was exposed and is now critically ill in an intensive care unit on life support. So, uh, you know, it does happen. And so we are at risk, frankly. And I think virtual care, care paradigms could help reduce our exposure. And rather than standing in a lineup in a, in a drive through of cars uh, with a clipboard and my arms exposed um, and every second person coughing on me as I take a history through a window, I could do this all virtually. Yeah. I mean, it de definitely sounds like it, keep, it could possibly keep everybody uh, much, much safer. Yeah. Uh, Chuck, Chuck comes to us. Uh, he has some experience in virtual work, uh, virtual meetings, um, and he has been trying to push his local medical clinic to adopt some of these virtual uh, care practices, but has been unsuccessful. Do you have any recommendations for how, how we can try to bring this to our healthcare communities around us? Yeah. So uh, this is such a, a great question, Adam. So prior to the epidemic, my philosophy was crawl, walk, and run in exposing a new, an organization to new technologies like this. And certainly even in my own hospital in, in, in Canada, we've been slow to adopt new technologies such as virtual care. Having said that, now that things are changing so rapidly, I would argue that it's incumbent of our administrators to, to, to look at new technologies and make hasty decisions. I mean, we, made, we, we, we adopted pop-up drive-through clinics overnight. That wasn't a thing in healthcare like 48 hours ago, and now they're everywhere. So why can't we make similar policy decisions to disseminate what I would argue is cheaper and more effective technology? So for those, uh, you know, organizations that don't know, you know, it just goes, goes back to the uh, initial mandate of Singularity University, uh, which is it's, it's, there's an exponential rise in these technologies for a reason. So I encourage people to get informed. And once they are informed, I think they'll make good decisions. So that is the, is the action item there just to, you know, take some uh, research or some examples to your local healthcare operators and be like, look, look at this information, like how do we get this done or you know, what should people do? Yeah, in fact, it's so, so not even an hour before this, this broadcast, my cousin who is a care provider, a, a doctor in Seattle, which is very much the epicenter or one of the epicenters in the United States is doing pop-up screening clinics in their parking lot. And their clinic, where there's a number of providers have no virtual care tools at all in place. And yet there's billing codes in place. There's systems in place in the United States. There's hundreds of vendors providing this. They literally would need to slap the, uh, you know, snap the fingers. And by tomorrow, they'd have an entire virtual care pro program in place in their clinic that they could scale. But she told me that their clinic is still not ready. And so mm -hmm. she said she's going to play this broadcast in her clinic live in real time. So we're hoping that it starts to change some minds. It starts to make people think about what they're doing and how could they do things better. Got it. Well, th there you go. If you're looking for a, a source of data, uh, share Sonny's presentation with your local <laughs> healthcare providers and see what happens. Um, all right. We just have a couple seconds left, but any, any last words you want to share with the group? Uh, from my perspective, you know, I think you covered it all, Adam. I just want everybody to stay safe, uh, socially isolate if you can, and, and um, get information. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being here with us. Um, enjoy the day with your daughter. Um, got, got to hear her briefly earlier, but uh, enjoy that. Thanks for joining us. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe.
Thanks, everybody. Cheers. All right. See ya. Bye. All right. Well, that is it for Sunny. Uh, and next up, we've got Dr. Sabine Seymour. Um, and we're going to be talking about how can we use data uh, to monitor our lifestyle. So there were a couple questions in there that were about data that we have access to, uh, what tools to use. And then I think Sabine is really going to help us out with a lot of those. For people that are asking, <clears throat> um, yes, we are working to get slides from everybody and we will be posting them as much as possible. We've got a shared resources document that the team just posted in the chat. You can check that out. When we get the slides, we'll put them in there. Eventually, this will become a web page. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, join the Facebook group. YouTube playlist of previous sessions um, are in there. And, and of course, you know, follow up with, with Sunny. I think Sunny's active on, uh, on social media. You can definitely find him on LinkedIn. We're also happy to make those connections if you're trying to figure out how do we get this technology to a specific organization that you're working with. Um, that's what we love to do is connect the dots inside of this ecosystem. So we are going to um, shut this one down and head over to the next session. I will see you all in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. So stay tuned.